Yes, thank you everyone for being here. Thanks again to Iaswam Benelux, who is co-presenting this event uh, in their Pop Talk series. Uh, please do check out the Iaswam Benelux uh, website for future Pop Talks events. We've got exciting things planned uh, this year. This is also a co-presentation uh, with the Music, Sound, and um, Media Cultures uh, lecture series called Music Matters. Um, and this um, is the first event in the 2021 Music Matters lecture series, so please check out Music Matters. So it's a real pleasure to be presenting with you, uh, Kristen, and um, to have both of our books uh, in this wonderful series. And I, I wanted to start my section just by thanking um, so many of the uh, people who were essential to bringing this book uh, to life. Um, and I'm going to start my uh, slideshow because the, all the thanks are on there. So um, I, I want to thank again everyone uh, for being here today and thank especially uh, Nicholas Gebhardt and Tony Witten for being here today. They're the editors of the wonderful Transnational Studies and Jazz series that both of these books are in. And I'm, event I'm immensely grateful uh, for your work. Yeah, so thank you both for being here today and for the work uh, that you did to bring this series into being. I'm also, also immensely grateful to all the amazing people at the International Institute for Critical Studies and Improvisation. Uh, the bulk of the research for this book was done uh, while I was a postdoctoral fellow with the Institute. And so, of course, this book wouldn't exist without this groundbreaking institute. And Paul Dutton is the amazing artist and person whose powerful performances and generosity first shaped my interest in sound singing. And, uh, and he's going to be here in a minute. Uh, he was here and he's dropped out um, and I believe he's fixing some technical problems and we'll be back in a moment, but, uh, oh, he's made it back in. Okay, that's excellent. Um, thanks, Paul, um, for being here today. Uh, I didn't know it back then, but my life as an ethnomusicologist began when I was an undergraduate student and Paul was kind enough to sit down with me for my first interview uh, with an artist. And seeing and hearing him perform for the first time with nothing but his body as an instrument and a relationship to that body that was both about a degree of control over a complex system and a desire to lose control, to be working in a space um, that could surprise him, uh, that well, that system could surprise him, to surrender to chance and contingency, uh, to be working in a space where things can emerge spontaneously. And the environment and the living moment are not just a container of a performance, but part of it as well. Seeing him work in that way was enlivening for me and gifted me with a performance practice that's been central to my life since that moment, and that's the foundation of this book. So it's a real honor to have you here today, Paul. Uh, this book would, of course, not exist without you. And I'm so pleased that all of us are going to get to hear from you next on the program. So Paul has written a wide variety of important articles and book chapters on the history of sound singing and the poetic practices that fed into it and on the border blur between music and poetry. He's the inventor of the term sound singing which I use in the book in two senses, both as a way of referring to a practice of using a wide and diverse variety of vocal and non-vocal oral sounds as a sonic palette, and in a philosophical sense of singing practices that embrace sounds that certain listeners don't want to hear other human bodies make. The book was originally supposed to be called Sound Singing, Extra Normal Vocal Practices and the Problem of the Human. The title change to Voices Found Free Jazz and Singing has, I think, pros and cons. One of the pros is that the word jazz ended up in the title. Now, jazz is a tricky word. It's a word rejected by people who, to be more progressive, should have embraced it. And it's a word that's been embraced by people who should have rejected it. Positioning the music I write about in this book as jazz causes certain tensions. It's not a term that some of the vocalists I write about identify with. However, there's no doubt that jazz spaces and practices were important to the emergence of most or all of the music I wrote about. And I think claiming a space for this music in jazz histories and jazz studies is good for jazz histories and jazz studies. 
the marginalization of the voice in jazz histories and jazz studies is a considerable problem. It's part of a wider modernist tendency to celebrate masculinity and virtuosity and to marginalize the feminine and musical practices and histories that don't fit easily into a modernist progress narrative. Leaving those histories and practices out leads young musicians to reproduce those modernist values and to choose complexity over community, hierarchy over inclusivity, and elite aesthetics over recognition of the value of certain musics that emerge in mixed ability intercultural exchange. I hope this book contributes to a broader wave of resistance against the dominance of modernist ideologies and jazz cultures and jazz studies that's certainly ongoing, but also seemingly diminishing. So the term sound singing took one for the team in this case by being excised from the title. One reason this was unfortunate was that I've always identified with this term since I first encountered Paul's work. And another is because sound singing is capable of alluding to the extent to which vocal practices I'm concerned with in the book are not only a part of jazz music, they're also present in contemporary classical music, a wide variety of popular musics, as well as sound poetry, all of which are discussed in the book alongside jazz. In the book, mostly in the introduction and in chapter five, I form a theory of the ways certain vocal sounds in all of these genres and in everyday life in general can have important socio-political effects. We all know that certain forms of music have been considered unmusical by different listeners that universalize their own tastes and values. This false musical versus unmusical binary gets placed alongside other binaries like human animal, civilized primitive, male, female, abled and disabled. And a symbolic order is created that situates certain bodies and certain voices as fully human and as fully musical and other human bodies and voices as less than fully human and as unmusical. But when human bodies that are viewed as fully human embrace sounds that are heard as less than fully human, this symbolic order can get disrupted in a way that I think is meaningful. The reason I think it's meaningful is because I've seen listeners work to try to restore that symbolic order. I tell a story in chapter five of one time I sang duets with Paul in Toronto, and an audience member took the mic after we were done and theatrically tried to put our sounds back where he thought they belonged not in our human bodies, but in bodies that were out of control or who were non-human animals. I also look closely in the book at the ways the listeners have aggressively responded to Yoko Ono's improvised vocal performances. And there too, you see the same kind of restoration of a symbolic order that she disturbed. I invited Paul to contribute to today's session in honor of the central role he's played in my life and in the coming into being of this book. But we're blessed today with the presence of many of the, the other amazing musicians that I've had the honor of meeting and working with in various ways. We have uh, Maggie Nichols uh, in the room today. We have David Moss. We have Kathy Kennedy. Um, I'm not sure if I'm missing anyone because I can't see the chat right now, but thank you all for being here. And if there's anyone I missed, I apologize. I want to thank you all as well in this public forum, not only for the time that you gave me for this project, but for the unique and impactful ways that you've chosen to work in your career. My book makes an attempt to convey how life-changing your work has been for so many. Not only have you chosen to work with sounds that push listeners to question their notions of what sounds are musical and human? You've all given your time to the creation of spaces where others can publicly and communally explore their voices. Often these projects include people who have been told they have bad voices and they should keep silent and finding a space where their sounds are heard, accepted and celebrated has been life-changing for them. Because in my research, I've seen how transformative this work has been, I've now devoted myself to, to creating these spaces. 
And there's there's a bunch of uh, the Groningen Vocal Exploration Choir members uh, in the room today. Thank you guys for being here too. I've had people tell me that this work has saved their lives. It's, it's meaningful. My book has made an attempt to document the development of what in the book I call free jazz choirs. And these include Maggie Nichols' workshops in the 1960s and beyond, and her decades of work with The Gathering. They include Phil Minton's extensive work with his feral choirs, which incidentally, uh, we're working together on, on having a virtual uh, version of, um, and there's a session on Monday. If you're interested in joining, you can send me an email and I'll give you the information on how to join that. It also includes David Moss's Institute for Living Voice, and various projects like his New Babel and Provocalia choirs, and many more recent choirs that I write about. The sixth chapter of my book, Radical Inclusivity and the Participatory Politics of Improvising Choirs, focuses on this history and the impact of this important improvising choir work. And the fourth chapter deals with David's Institute for Living Voice and the way it was structured to foster diversity and openness in its students. He explained that this was an exploratory rather than a conservatory and students were not accepted if they were interested in only one type of singing. And uh, at the end of the session, David, if you wanna say a few words about that, it would be lovely to hear from you. And again, thank you for being here. So if you all read this book, you're gonna be exposed to some radical, wonderful ideas about how we can have the greatest impact as music makers and community organizers. In between my chapters, I've included substantial excerpts from 13 of the interviews I conducted for the project. And the International Institute for Critical Studies and Improvisation has also made me a web page uh, for the project, and slowly I'm uploading the full interviews as well there. The interview with Faye Victor contains important lessons, lessons about gender politics and jazz, and the way vocalists are treated in certain jazz communities. The interview with Christine Jeffrey has things to teach us about how musical communities alienate their members and pressure them to repeat themselves instead of flowing where they're compelled to flow. The interview with Monkwe and Dosi reflects beautifully on the way singers allow environmental sounds to inform their vocal work. And some of the book's most important lessons come from Maggie Nichols' discussions of how musicians can and should cultivate social virtuosity. And Maggie, thank you for being here as well. And if you wanna say something at the end, it would be lovely to hear from you as well. The first three chapters of the book are largely historical. The second chapter traces the connections between sound poetry in the 1950s and 1960s and early free jazz voice. This chapter also includes histories relevant to technology studies about, about how tape devices changed sound poetry practices, how sampling changed downtown New York jazz musicians thought about the voice and how electronic sounds have informed vocal timbres in this field. Chapter three has interesting things to say about the history of scat and Louis Armstrong's most extra normal vocal moments, about singers like Linda Sharoke, Leon Thomas, Roy Hart, and Dimitri Ostratos. And the first chapter goes into details about the ways theater, poetry, dance, and even sculpture were fundamental to shaping jazz vocal practices. And it draws on archival work I completed in Berkeley and the Getty Center in New York that unearthed important details about the careers of Gene Lee and Yoko Ono, among some of the other vocalists that I've mentioned. And if you buy the soft cover version of the book, you get this beautiful picture of David with his big drum kit and his tiny microphone. And this picture was taken back in 1985 in Groningen, where Kristen and I teach in the Netherlands. And it pleased me to no end to have a little piece of local jazz history uh, from my new home adorning uh, the cover of the book. And so that's all I'll say for now. Um, and we'll go from here to where it all started. Um, if Paul Dutton is in the room, um, I give the floor now to uh, my mentor, my friend, the brilliant and uncompromising Paul Dutton. Wow, I've got a lot to live up to. <laughs> okay, um, Chris suggested that I do whatever I want, and he also suggested uh, that I I might do a bit of a performance. So I'm going to start with a piece of mine called Snare Kick Rack and Floor. 
could make out the words in there and they're there thank you very much oh, uh, combustible compatibility and compatible combustibility is somebody saying something sorry okay uh so and that's a little bit of uh gives you an idea of why i call it sound singing uh there wasn't an awful lot of voice in that well there was a lot of a lot of other than voice let's say uh, but uh, this question of terminology, well, first of all, congratulations, Chris, and uh, let me give a, my heartfelt endorsement of the book, uh, quite apart from all the praise that uh, Chris gave me. Um, I find the book to be, I haven't read it all, I'll be honest about that, but what I've read is, I'm frankly astounded. If I put the ball in play, Chris has really picked it up and run with it. He's gone places further than I'd ever conceived of in his writing and his research. And um, the book is an eye opener to me in a lot of ways. And um, I'd like to just say a, a, a little bit about the terminology thing, uh, which is that I, I identify mostly with a, a non idiomatic to use uh, Derek Bailey's phrase, non enigmatic imp free improvisation. And, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, terminology, well, what the hell? Somebody said in the previous presentation, there's only two things in music, good and bad. And of course, Louis Armstrong's famous for having made that statement, and, and many other people have said the same thing. But, uh, people we do use terms and people do to do uh have associations with terms and uh you can't fight it um i'm thinking i'm mindful of a, an incident that occurred back in 2012 uh tommy denise who was then uh, heading up the crack festival did me the the honor of having me open for Roscoe Mitchell at uh, Larcheduc in um, in um, Belgium in um, oh God isn't this horrible uh, going down on International Book Launch Day um, where's what's the city that large the capital of Belgium for God's sake where's my head we have, we have Brussels suggested in the chat here <laughs> yeah, <yes>. sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure most of you there will be familiar with uh, Lars Duke. Anyway, uh, I had the honor of opening for uh, Roscoe Mitchell, and uh, two things happened that are relevant to this book in that instance. One was that I was told after that uh, a lady came up to the poor ticket takers, who of course were completely nothing, were nothing but functionaries there, and complained quite bitterly that 
What was this? I came. I came to hear free jazz. I didn't. What? What, what was all this? Uh, this experimental music that was going on. Me. Um, so um, the other thing was that at uh, after the performance, um, there was a young boy in the audience there with his father and he wanted to have his picture taken with me and he was just he was just blown away he was about oh 10 or 11 something like that and so uh there you had both ends of the spectrum but <clears throat> excuse me so um it's uh, i was reminded of all of this when chris was talking about uh his wrestling with terminology so there we go and in fact i said to chris when i saw an earlier version of the book i said i don't know do you you're calling me a you're calling me a a, a, a jazz singer a uh, free voice jazz singer but still jazz i do i i'm not sure i really fit under that rubric and uh he said well he thought i did and i said well well, this was all in writing, actually, but I, my reply was, well, you're the, you're the authority now. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I want to repeat that. Um, I mentioned the, that young lad at that performance at Lars Duke because I hope he finds his way somewhere, somehow, to this book. I don't know. I never knew his name. I have no way of knowing I don't even I, I guess he lives in Brussels but um, he if he's interested in this area at all I hope that he will uh, find his way to this book and the richness of information in it and um, I just I, I'm I'm really knocked out by it and uh, that's not just uh, not just because Chris is a friend and um, and uh, uh, previously a, a protege. Now I feel like his protege. There's so much I'm learning from this book, Chris, that uh, it's just amazing to me. And uh, it's not a term I like to use very much, but it really is. I just think, holy, it, it, geez, I didn't know that. Boy, little areas that I knew a little bit about, and you have gone in there and with the tenacity of a ferret, you've just really expanded the information so i hope that young lad who now is a young man uh, what 11 years uh, seven years later seven whatever uh, i'm as bad at arith arithmetic as i am at geography <laughs> so i hope that that young man finds his way to your book chris and that he will uh, whether he's a practitioner or just a, a an enthusiastic listener that he will um that he will uh, be able to have his mind expanded and his 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 scope and vision uh, broadened by uh, the book uh, amazing piece of of research and uh, testimony to your passion and enthusiasm so uh with those words um i'm i will finish off with uh, another brief little uh piece and it's one of a series that i call the anti-lyrics and it's um it's this one is uh is titled um anti-lyrics uh anti-lyrics cj Oh, my God. 
And there we go. Okay, so thanks again, Chris. Keep up the good work. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, Paul, thank you so much. What a pleasure to have your sounds uh, in my head. And and uh, you, you made me tear up a little. Thank you for your kind words. Um, it's uh, it's an honor to be able to share your work uh, with others, uh, both in this forum and through the book. And um, thank you so much for being here today. Pleasure. So, Oh, there he is. <laughs> and I like I like that you had your camera off until just now, too. Oh, because, I had no idea. Oh, I was going to maybe mention it, but I, I like in this forum that, that we can just close our eyes and listen often because, you know, the screen sometimes is so taxing but, and your sounds are what matter um, so much. Um, and so uh, it's good to see you now. And uh, okay. totally right. fine that it was off until now. Um, now um, I, I guess have I the, mute my mic now. Should I? Uh, yeah, until you want to maybe say something again later, which is uh, it's an option. Um, but now, yes, we'll go now to uh, Carrie West. I have the great honor of uh, introducing her. Um, she's a voice researcher and singer herself, um, a PhD student in uh, the uh, Critical Studies in Improvisation program at the University of Guelph. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, honor to have her here uh, to comment on the book next. Thanks, Welcome, Chris. Um, thank you very much. Uh, wow, this is just with the last hour and and all that's happening during this hour. I'm so moved by um, just the sort of the generational uh, inspiration that's going on and all the um, all the ways we can inspire each other. Um, it's a great honor to have been asked to um, talk about this book. Um, and I want to begin by saying how honored I am just to be included in this event. And I want to thank the organizers and those, um, all of you who are in attendance, uh, for your kind attention as well. In light of the fact that we cannot gather to sing together in these types, these, these types of events really help remind me that when it is possible to make music as a community again, I'll be ready, and so will you. I begin my comments by giving you a bit of a background of my work as a singer. I'm a self-taught musician who grew up in Toronto, Canada, and when people ask me where I studied, I like to tell them Grossman's Tavern, which is a dive bar in that city that's famous for hosting blues jams, and among other things, for not carting teenagers. <laughs> Though Toronto's vibrant music scene, um, through Toronto's vibrant music scene, I was able to learn from some wonderfully skilled musicians, and I carved out a modest career for myself as a singer. Uh, one of the groups that I worked in was the Jazz Standard Outfit, which very much capitalized on the um, resurgence of swing music in the uh, early aughts. And uh, I favored songs made famous by Ella Fitzgerald. I was about 20 years old when I was doing that work. And at the outset, I figured you could learn anything you needed to know about singing from Ella. And there may be some truth to that. But despite learning from arguably one of the greatest scat singers, my lack of formal education kept me intimidated on the bandstand. And I stuck to the formal parts of the song. Vocal improvisation felt elusive to me. Learning through mimesis has its limits. Um, Gary Peters talks about one of the great fears of improvisation is not that you will have a bad idea, but that you will have no idea. And I sort of had no idea how to get started. Um, so most musicians need a day job and I was lucky enough to be hired at a private elementary school where the principal wanted to hire a real musician. And apparently I fit the bill. I found out very quickly on that job that jazz is considered old people's music and so is rock. And at the time, it was 20 years ago, um, rap was what every seven-year-old was really into. And given that Dr. Dre has recently had health issues, I suppose that rap is also now old people's music. But I guess, um, anyway, I was in search of resources. And so I trained as an ORF pedagogy specialist. For anyone who doesn't know, Carl Orff developed a children's curriculum that prizes musical improvisation as the highest form of fluency. 
So there I was facilitating children's improvisations during the day and avoiding any such engagements in my own performances at night. And I literally coached re reticent singers through improvisation activities while remaining firmly within my own comfort zone on the stage. Very bad teaching practice. Surely things were going to have to change. In 2013, I left Toronto and moved to the city of Guelph. And in surveying the music scene there, I found that the university was offering a series of workshops on vocal improvisation, culminating in a symposium on voice and agency that spring. It was free and it was available to the public. So I went and everything changed. I got to meet many of the artists that are featured in the book we're celebrating today. And all because some guy named Chris Tonelli had a postdoc at the International Institute for Critical Studies and Improvisation, researching vocal improvisation. And I didn't know that was a thing you could do. And it, it turns out it is a thing. And so I decided to go do it. And now I'm <laughs> studying vocal improvisation at the University of Guelph. Um, I tell this story not to be self-centered, but to underscore the resource that's provided by Chris's work and the book that has emerged from his research. So many aspects of learning music come from a kind of self-directed ethnography where you hear a song and you think, who's making this incredible music? How can I learn how to do that? Who, you know, who were those musicians' teachers? And so you follow the breadcrumbs until you get to the bakery. In this book, I found a wealth of resources and inspiration. What a relief to know that there's a grounded tradition of people who have learned through vocal improvisation how to present multiplicitous aspects of their lives in a world that relentlessly categorizes people trying to flatten us out so that we are readable. There are women who defined a new relationship to public performance, rejecting the role of the chick singer and taking their places as equal contributors in the music they produced. Um, I just just to talk about how much of a prevalent problem that is, Kim Gordon starts her book, uh, A Girl in a Band, off um, with a passage that discusses how she was choreographed to stand in the middle of the stage um, and draw the male gaze. Uh, and if Kim Gordon can't transcend some of those um, traditional gender roles, I don't know who can, but uh, this book is full of women who did it. How affirming to hear the stories of other artists who resource their experiences from other genres and event other than and even other kinds of art making practices to develop new considerations of singing. To hear that this process is often self taught but rigorously practiced was so encouraging to me, made it accessible. To discover that communities of these people, like everyone here today, are on the rise is so reassuring and that. Their presence refutes the script we've been given about what our bodies are capable of and what is acceptable behavior in growing numbers is truly heartening. And that's all well and good for me, a singer and clearly a converted improv improvisation <laughs> nerd. But what Chris Tonelli does so well in this book is to articulate the radical impact improvised singing has had and continues to have in questioning everything stale and oppressive. This is a fact that the artists themselves know and they live, but it's also under discussed and under circulated. Although goodness knows the artists try to spread the word around. Um, Voices Found gives us more than previously, his, like a previously hidden history of free jazz singing. And even in the practice of including the artists' interviews, most researchers um, don't have that much transparency when they theorize. Recently, I attended a talk by Black Studies scholar George Lipsitz, who spoke about accompaniment in improvisation. And he asked, what work do you want the work to do? And what Chris Tonelli's book accomplishes is an, an accompaniment to the work of his many heroes and his colleagues whom he shines a light on. Voices Found lets us know that the careers of Gene Lee, Yoko Ono, Paul Dutton, Maggie Nichols, Phil Minton, among others who he um, focuses on, is work that works out long-standing arguments about the roles of sex and gender and what an able body is and how communities work with dissonance as well as with harmony. The insights Chris brings to considering the work of free jazz singing or sound singing brings critical attention to an art form that's often dismissed, diminished, or ridiculed. And I think most notably that the essay 
called Policing Yoko Ono is a really fabulous indictment of the racism and sexism at work in her public reception. It's a much needed examination of what Suzanne Cusick refers to as the mind body problem. And Chris's defense of Ono reminds us what can happen to a person who understands that as Cusick writes, much of the pleasure in music is afforded by the opportunity it gives us to play ourselves free of gender's rigidities. And in this case, I would also add race. The book is a strong statement that places vocalists and the voice in the deserved position of being an instrument, one whose technical and expressive potential is quite likely limitless. Darius Jones said, the lesson of the voice teaches us that we are diverse, as no two people sound exactly the same. Voices Found teaches that engaging with that diversity is a radical act. As the book concludes, quote, if sound singing tomorrow had no social political potential, that'd be great. It would mean that it no longer exists in the philosophical sense of the term, and all singing is heard, accepted, and enjoyed as singing, offending no one and threatening nothing. While we work towards that possibility, we have this book as a guide, not just on how people have changed an art form, but what happened to the world around them as they did. Thank you so much for uh, the the work of the many musicians that are here today and the ones that are featured in this book. And thank you, Chris, for making it um, accessible. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you so much, Gary. <laughs> All right, now you both made me tear up. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, lovely words. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, at one point, as you spoke, um, I, I love this medium, actually, you know, I, I, that's the only thing I disagree with you about, Carrie, is that, that, that we haven't, we don't need to stop sharing in this time and we don't need to stop singing together. Um, in fact, we're going to do that before the end of uh, this session. We're all going to be invited to, to use our voices together. And it's beautiful in this medium. The way that Google Meets records us is one face at a time, kind of randomly, whichever one it wants to... Uh, uh, put in the foreground. Um, at one point, um, as you were speaking, I, I saw Maggie Nichols smile. And Maggie Nichols is here today. And I don't know, Maggie, would you say a few words? <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. I, I, it's a brilliant book. It is a brilliant book. I, I love all of it, to be honest with you. And, and, and I think as somebody who's not academic, I really... Um, you know, Catherine, the way you spoke, same, I started in pubs and clubs. My first singing job was in a strip club. So I really get that one and that insecurity, especially in the uh, 60s when we were all seen as these sort of nuisance chick singers, you know, not proper musicians and really taken advantage of in lots of ways, you know, to sort of, you know, to, to sort of find eventually, find the voice and find mentors like John Stevens and various people who actually introduced me like Paul, introduced you Chris to, to expressing my voice freely you know these practices of freedom it, it, it was thrilling it was sort of absolute liberation and of course you can model yourself on people who've abused you or you can model yourself on people who've mentored you and luckily I had people who mentored me as well because it makes a difference in the choices you make and that's why you know I'm so glad you your book features so much about community music you know and, and I like the fact that you, you work both on individual practitioners, but also community. And I, I love that. And also, too, we're very grateful, those of, those of us who are not academics, for people who are to actually not write us out of history. Because time and time again, especially women and, and black musicians and black women in particular, um, instrumentalists as well, you know, have been written out of history. So it's great, like Catherine says, that you um, feature in our own words. I love that. I love the fact that our interviews are actually in there and, and your voice is in there too. So you, you both managed to sort of be a researcher and sort of step back from that, but also your own feelings are in there too. It's not a dry academic book in that sense. It's a, it's a very living, living book. Um, I don't, I'm, I, I think everybody's spoken so well. I'm not sure <laughs> what else I can sort of, um, say really except you know that yeah you know, and paul oh i loved your pieces oh fantastic fantastic so yes i'm so glad to be part of this community of sound singers and free jazz because i'm steeped in jazz you know i i, I was once accused somebody 
and th this jazz Britannia they did and they showed um, free jazz and they interviewed various people and then they showed clips of me and Phil Minton and um, they particularly chose a, a clip of me where I really was sound singing and I was making what might be called noises and they accused me of killing jazz which I thought was actually really hurtful you know although some people would say well great you know a lot of people said oh yeah you should get a band the jazz killers but no I love jazz you know so the fact that you can actually evolve from that into sound singing without actually you know actually denouncing it but recognize that I've evolved from that and that it's part of a sort of uh, an evolutionary revolutionary process and and jazz in its essence has always been revolutionary yes it might become mannered and stylized in those that um, sort of maybe sanitize it but in its essence it's always uh, been a, you know it's a black music that has pushed boundaries it's a revolutionary music so I feel really good about I think that title's great so all right, that's all I can say right now. <laughs> I look forward to singing with everybody at the end. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maggie, for adding those thoughts. You're, you're such a fount of wisdom, and I've learned so much um, from you in this process. And uh, and George, George McKay is here today as well, and I, I learned so much about George's writing um, and his interviews with you. So I want to thank you, George, since you're here today. Uh, for your research uh, as well. I uh, played a fantastic role in the production of this book. Um, David Moss is in the room as well uh, today, although I, I don't think his microphone's on. I'm not, I'm not sure if he's still here. I can't actually see him on my screen today, uh, right now. Oh, there he is, and his mic came on. Would you like to say a few words, David? Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, Chris, <laughs> yeah, your book is great, and we need your book because in our world, in this world we're in, we're always fighting battles, o battles over and over and over through history. We're always refighting to get the knowledge out there, to get the experience out there, to reacquaint people with what's been done, to say history exists. History is not what we want to do, but history exists. And we learn from history. <laughs> we learn from what has been done over the years, from the amazing things that people have done from from Cab Calloway, from uh, from people who should have, from from Screaming Jay Hawkins, who should have been in the, singing in the opera, uh, who should have been considered classless, raceless, amazing voices from the universe, who instead were put in a box somewhere. And uh, yeah, we shouldn't forget, and uh, we shouldn't always have to fight the battles. We should be a little bit free. We could be a little bit free to do the things we love, and uh, your book serves that purpose. So thanks, Chris. Thank you for being here today and for those words. I've learned so much from you as well. Um, we have also in the room uh, a, a, a lot of other people that I've sang with uh, over the years. Um, because of the choirs that I was inspired to form um, from seeing how transformative those choirs have been uh, when other singers have created this space for everyone to use their voice. I don't know if anyone uh, from any of my choirs would like to say a few words, but I invite you to take the floor if you do. Sorry, just using learning to use this technology. Um, I'm just I saw you reaching there. <laughs> <laughs> I saw me reaching. Um, I live in St. John's, Newfoundland, and I am a part or was a part of Chris Tellini's choir, um, the St. John's Vocal Exploration Choir or Vocal X. Um, it's got my, it helped me find out some more direction in my life and find out my voice is just years ago a person who got me into musical improvisation unfortunately passed and there wasn't necessarily an outlet for such it's just I love musical improvisation but was not a musician and finding the choir and voice and there's plenty of people who I've met since through like continuing my interest in musical improvisation like Carrie is here and she just spoke and I met her at musical improvisation at Land's End and it's just been a big source of community because it's just like, oh, there's this point in my life. And after that is when I started like meeting some very inspirational and important people and thinking about life in a 
a lens of musical community and voice. And like, that was just something very special for me. So thank you, Chris. <laughs> thank you for saying a few words, Cassandra. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, so as you can see from this, I mean, and from Carrie's comments that um, forming community through this practice um, is incredibly important and this practice, everyone has a voice um, and we can come together if we accept the beauty of all vocal sound and improvise together. Um, forming community through that practice uh, is again, I think transformative for so many of us. And so I wanna give everyone a chance uh, to do this together. I've been now since the summer, um, organizing my choir sessions online. Um, and I think, you know, it, there's certain aspects of singing together online um, that if we focus on what's missing, we might find it impoverishing. But the lesson of improvisation is never to allow a preconception to get in the way of appreciating what's rich about the moment and what's rich about what we're doing now. Um, so there's ways that even across the screens, uh, we can be together. I mean, I was planning on launching this book by doing a variety of events over the summer in multiple different cities. Obviously, I couldn't do that. Um, and there's certain things that are lost because of that. But then this moment has been really beautiful for me. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And having all of us here, no matter where we are in the world, uh, together in this forum um, is, is a powerful thing as well. So. I, I think we'll make a little time since we do have 15 minutes left uh, for just general thoughts and questions about either of the books, but maybe it's 6.45 now. Let's take five minutes. Let's everyone open the mic. If you're self-conscious, you might want to shut the, the camera off. Um, and let's just sound together um, completely improvisationally for about five minutes. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Love how it whittled down to a trio and then a quartet and then a solo and then a duo to end. Very beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. So a lot can be found in this practice um, that's incredibly rewarding. Um, if people are interested in doing more of this work, please get in touch with me because, again, I am doing these sessions regularly. If you find this would be comforting and inspiring, we welcome everyone in all voices. Um, it would be wonderful to be able to do it again in person, though, uh, as well, um, and hopefully that moment will come soon. Uh, so we do have about eight minutes uh, left in this session. Uh, if there are any other final comments or questions for either myself or Dr. McGee. Yes, I would love to say something at this last moment. Thank you, Chris, for coming to Groningen and, and for saving our all lives, really. I really, really appreciate that you organized this choir here for us. And it really helps many people, at least me a lot, and still it does. So thank you very much. And also congratulations for this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful session here with you and Christine. Thank you and congrats again. Thank you, Baron. Any other comments or questions?
Susanna in the chat saying, uh, good to combine these. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed, especially Fabian, your comments about modernism and how that uh, you were speaking about Kristen's book, but um, really resonated with um, some of the things that came up in mine as well. And so it's nice to connect the two books on, on that level. Chris, it was um, it was um, this whole experience was amazing for me. The I mean, the, your your presentation, your book sounds uh, really amazing, and and uh, and like everyone else, I was very moved by by both the singing and and the um, your presentation. I, I was wondering if you. I was just curious to. I'm trying to you know find some some ground after this. Uh, um, uh, this overwhelming experience. Have you done any? Feel work together, or I mean, Kristen <laughs> and Kristen, apart from the karaoke bar in Castle. <laughs> well, that was a good first step. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and no, we no, we haven't, but um, but we should, we should. Yeah, that's an Let idea for maybe our next question. book. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I so. Kristen's been the most wonderful colleague um, ever, and, and and you know being able to be here and work with her has been a great honor. So it's it's nice to be able to say that in a, in a public forum. <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you, Chris. And I can only reverse the compliment. It's just been so fantastic having you in Groningen, and the music section has just grown immensely from your presence and your research. So wow. yes, yeah, so great. We we could meet all of you here today, and we we feel just honored that you take the time and get another hour on your computers to come and see us. We know that. It, it has its limits in some sense, but we've created some community today, so that's been really nice to experience. Um, maybe before uh, I forget to do this, um, I think there might be another representative of Iaspum Benelux uh, here to tell us a bit about the next Pop Talk session. Is that true? I think he had to leave. Oh, <laughs> no, that's unfortunate. Um, can you tell us a bit about that session, um, Dr. Schilling? <laughs> um, I, I don't know that much details about it really, but um, the idea is to have another book launch coming up soon. And um, the book is called uh, Made in Germany. It's an edited volume of different articles about uh, yeah, popular music in Germany, uh, both historically and contemporary. Um, but I'm not sure about the date and I'm not sure about, I think the idea is to make it a little bit more of a workshop, so not uh, a little bit like a free forum as we have today, so not like strict academic presentations, but also to have a bit more dialogue between different uh, authors that have contributed chapters to the book. But um, I think the date isn't set yet, so if you are interested, um, consider becoming a member of IASPM Benelux. Um, I can post the link one more time in a minute. Um, it's very cheap to be become a member and you will be updated on all events that we have in the series and everything else that we do. And uh, we need your support and it's uh, good to meet everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schiller. And um, uh, Nora, I see that you're here. Could you tell us maybe about the next Music Matters lecture? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> That was a bit of a surprise. Uh, so this is the first Music Matters uh, event of this year. And then the next one will be by uh, Dr. Dylan Robinson. Um, it will be a lecture and discussion on his book, Hungry Listening or on Listening Positionality. And it will take place on April 28th from five to seven. So same time slot as right now. It's also free and online and um, everyone can join. It would make sense to register first probably. Um, there's going to be future Music Matters um, lectures as well this year, um, but there's still, um, well, I'm still not finished with the posters, so <laughs> they'll be updated <laughs> soon. But I'll send the link to the um, Dylan Robinson one in the chat now. Yeah, fantastic. And just to, we have confirmed the date for Dr. Kira Gant, who will be presenting her work on Black girls' music and, and games and the kind of mediated responses to those. That is going to take place on May 14th. But I think, Nora, we hadn't told you the date yet. So now that's also been made official. So I had to interject. <laughs> Fantastic. And thank you for all the kind words that are uh, appearing in the chat. Um, uh, Tara, you asked to ask a question. We'd love to hear from you before we're done. 
Yeah, I was I was a little bit hesitant to ask about this also now because we're a little bit running out of time, but I I wanted to to ask try anyways because I I, I did come to some of your choir sessions, and I I had a lot of trouble improvising especially or like the the real fully improvised sections as 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 we would do, and I. And that, I mean, that was a very difficult moment for me. And it was also like a little bit embarrassing in a way because everyone was able to do it, but I wasn't able to do it. And I wasn't really sure why it was so difficult. And I wanted to ask you maybe something about this, like, I mean, not necessarily for myself or that you're my voice therapist or anything, but more in the sense of why do you think it can be so difficult or, or what is it that you're, that's holding you back so much and what can the liberation from sound singing, yeah, or mean? I think that's a really lovely question to end on. We have so many experts uh, in the room on that question. Uh, I'm hearing their voices uh, in my head from the, uh, the time that I've spent reading their words and speaking with them. Uh, would anyone like to answer that question to close our session? Why is improvisation so hard and, and how do we embrace it? I'm, I'll, I'll have a wee go. Wonderful. I, 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 think, I think sometimes I think for me, there are two ways in, or well, there's many ways in, but two of the ways I've experienced is either with John, there were little springboard pieces where in fact the instruction was almost not to improvise. For example, the sustain piece where you're just repeating one note over and over. And so you're thinking, oh God, that's all I've got to do. I was terrified. And he said, it doesn't matter if your voice wobbles, wavers or croaks. And my voice was like, ah, I was terrified. He was playing a gong. Trevor Watts was playing an alto. And what happened, I, I got so hypnotized by just repeating a note and not, I wasn't thinking I was going to improvise. It was almost a, what my mate Gary Whiteley, bass player, calls a benevolent trick. Because the next thing I knew I was improvising, I didn't expect it. The other way for me, which we have in the gathering, is almost to just feel that you can almost be anonymous and you could just maybe... You know, if I if somebody comes to the gathering and they sit next to me and they're really scared, I, instead of doing lots of, you know, like very free stuff, I might just go, <sighs> you know, just going from what we all do, because breathing is improvisation. I mean, it you know, every breath is different. So I suppose it's just demystifying it. I mean, other you, a lot, everybody here has got ways in. But I think why it's so difficult is we've been socialized to, to feel that either it's something very, very clever making it up or something really stupid and just loads of, it's either been completely disrespected or put on a pedestal. And either way, it's either made to seem that only clever people can do or it's something that is just hit and miss and it's a load of old bollocks, excuse my language. You know, so I think, I think those are some of the reasons, some of the barriers, but there are ways in and all of us here would would sort of facilitate that you can do it so it's one way to do it is just doing it when you're on your own when nobody's listening and you'll be surprised just start from the breath you're there when you cry when you go <laughs> i mean phil minton one of the things he does in feral choir is he just walks around and just gets everybody laughing <laughs> you know there's many ways in and paul i'm sure chris all of us you know we would there are ways in I don't know if that helps. If, if, does that make any sense? Did I just All wrap right. it on? <laughs> yes, no, sorry. I, 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 I missed the button. No, no, it's it's absolutely helpful. It's 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 funny because at home I can be very wacky and, and very yeah. noisy, but it's very difficult to do it where there is other other people or other people that are not my very close friends, for example. Yeah. Yeah, it's exposing yourself in a way that, that feels very uncomfortable. And it's embarrassing if you do it right, and it's embarrassing if you do it wrong, or at least for what you would feel is good or bad. Yeah, and no, that's the thing, too. We've been told to, like, Chris writes about that in the book a lot, policing policing the voice, and that's very much it. We've been told either, it's as you say, it's not right or it's wrong, and those are the sort of things, too, that are inhibited. And there are no wrong sounds. There are no wrong sounds. They're just not. not. The only sound I can't handle is that, warplanes and and when i hear a warplane i can cope with almost any sound but warplanes i think because i know they may be going to go and drop bombs those sounds sort of disturb me but on the whole almost any sound it's 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 sound it exists it's it's amazing 
Anybody Anything else? to add, Paul? Oh. What's that? Anything to add, Paul? I don't think I can add very much. I, <laughs> I can I can just underline, underscore, and and maybe uh, maybe repeat. But yes, about the question about uh, the question <clears throat> that was asked about why it's so difficult. Well, the forces of repression are pretty strong yeah. in society and in the world at large, and it's just it's it's a gradual process of just opening yourself up to what's inside you and what's inside all of us. And um, I, I, I really all I can do is just uh, second the things that have been said and all that all that Maggie said so, so eloquently. Well, it's a perfect place to end. Um, the forces of repression are so strong, and if a practice yeah. can awaken us to the the truth of you know all sounds uh, can be accepted, as Maggie said. Uh, I think it's a pretty powerful practice, and that's what I tried to get across. Uh, in the book, uh, thanks to all the work that you guys have done and all the inspiration you guys have given me. So thank you all so much for being here today on behalf of the Music, Sound, and Media Cultures area of the Arts, Culture, and Media Program at the University of Groningen, uh, and behalf of, on behalf of IASPM Benelux. And thank you so much again, uh, Dr. McGee, for presenting your work and for sharing uh, this session with me today. It was so wonderful to be able to present our books uh, at the same time in the same session. Um, and here, here. Uh, we'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. So great to see you. We hope to see you either here thanks. online or at some physical place in the future. <laughs> so long, thank you everyone. All the speakers and performers today. Yes, Take care. You. Ciao, ciao. Thank you.